everyone. Welcome to another great episode of Content and Conversation. Today, I'm excited to have Kelsey Jones, founder of Six Stories, on the program. Kelsey is an amazing mind on content strategy, SEO, and audits. Her consultancy does all of the above in a really great way. Uh, so excited to have you on, Kelsey. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I was, I was telling you before uh, we started recording here, I've been like more recently extra excited about content audits. <laughs> Uh, which not everyone gets, ex- I'm sure you get excited about audits, but uh, of course, not yeah. everyone probably, <laughs> not everyone probably does that. But more recently, I'm just getting excited because it feels to me like a critical component of a strong SEO content strategy. In our world, we're also trying to do less link building because we think the math doesn't work as well. So the, the thought is this is a critical like arm of that. So love to hear from someone with the experience of you that you do have um, on that in particular to hear all of your philosophy there. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I when you asked me what I wanted to talk about, content audits was the first thing I thought of because I think a lot of companies don't really think about that. I think for a long time, the focus has been on, you know, push that content, get new content out there. You need to be publishing to your website or your blog this many times per week. And that was the focus. But now what I try to tell clients or, you know, people I work with, we really need to think about the content that we've already published. And there's there's a lot there, um, especially if you have a good amount of posts where you know, easy changes or fixes can make a big impact. Agreed. Yeah. Internally, we've thought like our minds as content marketing matured and we had more clients that we had for several years as as Siege has gotten older, we do more and more updates and that can fall within the audit framework. But I think our mind didn't always go to as much like let's cut content that maybe someone else had made even though it was important um, as well. So it's kind of, obviously, you, you, I'm guessing in that context, you make both suggestions. Is that accurate to say? Right. Yeah. Whenever I do audits, it's kind of, it's holistic. So we go through the existing blog posts and decide whether uh, it needs to be revised, rewritten, um, uh, redirected. Maybe we're combining a bunch of posts into one central post or just left alone. I mean, it is possible that, you know, for whatever reason, whether it's more recent or we just want to leave a certain post alone. So those are usually the four actions that we decide to take, you know, on any post that that were all the posts we're reviewing as part of the audit process. That makes sense. So, I mean, that's a good segue. And you started talking about it there of just your overall kind of process behind audits. Like, could you share kind of how, how that works? Yeah, so there's several components to it. Um, So the first thing, which I kind of already described, is taking a list of all the existing posts and dumping them in a spreadsheet. Uh, We've done that before with Screaming Frog, or we sometimes we've had to, in a crunch, use like the RSS feed. It's definitely not as clean to pull something. Screaming Frog is a lot easier. Um, And then just kind of format it with the, the data that we want to look at and then have a decision column with the four options that I decided or I mentioned already. So there's a lot of metrics within that main spreadsheet that we look at, you know, existing traffic, existing revenue, if any, um, existing conversion percentage. If revenue isn't a factor, you know, there's some websites that they only want email signups. They only use their blog as a way to drive newsletter signups or ebook downloads or whatever. So we kind of look at that data as well. And then um, anything to do with keywords. So what's the main target keyword? And then what's the highest level keywords that the page ranks for? Because sometimes there's a disconnect between that. I mean, we always have a keyword that we wish our content ranked for. And then there's reality of what the the page actually ranks <laughs> Some for. Some random keyword. Yeah, which is yeah, sometimes yeah. really great keywords. And sometimes you think, why is this page ranking for that? So uh, that's all part of the process. And then from there, we kind of just build our report with additional data. So looking at Google Search Console to see uh, what we can pull from there with rankings, and then also look at uh, blog posts that maybe are ranking 
uh, in five to 10 or ranking on the second page of the search results for a target term. And those are usually ones that if we make a change or update them, they can get a lot of traction faster. So um, these are just some of the things that we're, you know, we use to weigh our determination. So we're not only looking at the, the decision to keep, revise, redirect, or um, rewrite, but once we make that, we also have to weigh the other metrics, like I mentioned, revenue, current traffic, uh, current ranking, priority. I mean, I've, I've had clients before that, you know, I wouldn't name a specific blog post as top priority, but they have their own reasons for why they want that one updated first. <laughs> so there's a lot of factors that go into it. That makes sense. So in that, in that, Two two questions came out of it. But I guess first one is, when you're doing a content audit, do you like is no page off limits? Like, are you literally looking at the entire site, or do you like start on a blog, or like how how do you think about that? Yeah, that's a really good point. So a lot of the sites I've done, the focus has been on the blog, but I do think that additional pages are just as important, and they're often more ignored. To your point. Um, so I had a client where they had a WordPress plugin um, and it had all these great features, but they were running behind on releasing separate feature pages for each of their new features of the plugin. So as they had new features coming out, they weren't adding copy. And so that was in that case, that was part of the audit process is identifying what new content as well, you know, which I didn't even touch on in, in my previous <laughs> answer, you know, sometimes there's landing pages, or I don't know, whatever other types of pages you need that you need to be added that don't even exist. And that kind of information can come out in this audit process as well. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good, good takeaway for sure. I wouldn't have thought about that. But it makes complete sense that that often can be a takeaway. So when you're when you're pulling those metrics, there's probably not a hard and fast rule, but I, uh, I'm wondering, are there certain things that you typically would set as the benchmarks of this is a cut range? Like, do you say zero, zero links, zero track? Like, what are those levels that you're, if you were, it's going to be a, it depends answer, but uh, what if there's a range for that, we'd, we'd love to hear what yours are. It totally is an it depends answer because I think it's based on like what your average traffic is. I mean, I've worked on sites where the blog itself gets, you know, 5 million visits a month. And then I've worked on sites like my own where it's like, oh, if I have 5,000 <laughs> visits per month, that's good. So I think I would look at the average. If you had to hold me to a number, um, anything that's getting like 100 visits or less a month, I would look at. Um, but with that, you know, this is going into the, it depends, like you shouldn't necessarily just remove that in your spreadsheet. You should also look at conversions because I've had clients where the blog post only got like 50 visits, but it had five conversions or, you know, whatever it is. So it actually was one of the highest conversion converting posts that month or whatever time frame we looked at. So there's a lot of things to weigh instead of just one thing or another. But when it comes to websites that have, you know, thousands and thousands of pages, I would look at, you know, you set your cutoff, whether that's 100 or 500 visits or whatever, and do those ones first, the ones you're going to analyze. And then maybe the next phase would be the lower traffic ones. And you can decide, hey, these actually are getting really high conversions and we should move them up the priority list or, these, we shouldn't even bother with them and leave them alone, or we should take action on these <laughs> because they have a lot of potential and there's a reason why they're getting such low traffic. Here's what we can change and actually turn them around to become higher traffic posts. So you made an interesting point there for people to consider here is kind of the phasing of this process. So is that your general sense when you make a recommendation to a client to like do cuts, say you had maybe 500 cuts for a bigger website or what have you would you, is there a certain suggestion of how they phase out deleting those just for risk mitigation yeah that's a good point what i've seen and this is just in my experience it's doing it gradually or doing it all at once 
either way doesn't necessarily make it better or worse. Um, whether you're doing it gradually or all at once, sometimes you will see that traffic fluctuation. But as long as you're doing the 301 redirects, again, at least in my experience, it hasn't been <laughs> bad. The actual implementation process. So when you're deciding to redirect posts and, and delete them, but redirecting the URLs, um, usually there's not a huge drop in traffic. Um, sometimes you might see drops in other metrics like time on site or um, conversion rate, but that's another part of the phase, right? Like how you mentioned, like once you do the edits, and the changes, then you need to look at if, if that actually made an impact. So reviewing the changes you did make in a set amount of time, whether that's a month or three months, um, that's usually what I like to check um, to see if it actually positively or negatively affected your metrics that you're focusing on. Um, so that's usually how I phase things. Um, and then another yeah. big part of the phasing process of, of what you're asking also depends on availability for the team. Because there's been times when it's just me by myself. So I'm going to do as much <laughs> as I can or like me and our writers that we have. So we're going to do up to our capacity, you know, at a consultancy level. And then I've also worked, you know, with companies where they have a whole full time content team and developers ready to go and they've made it a, a priority for their sprint or their quarter or whatever and we have a lot more bandwidth to do things faster um, with that too it also depends on the process for approval and changes so I worked at one with one client where the owner wanted to approve all the redirects he was super almost like micromanagey in that process so he wanted to approve them all. So again, that took a little bit more time because we had to bother him with follow-ups to get it approved. So all that stuff kind of plays into how fast you can make it all happen. That makes sense. So, I mean, what I'm hearing is as long as you're really confident in your data, there's not a lot of like feeling that there's risk in or need to phase it if you had resources available. Am I hearing that correctly? Right. Yeah. Yeah. But I've seen most people phase it just because like it is a process and, and you're going to have a lot of changes to make that usually can't be made, you know, all in one week. Immediately. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> so uh, one of the things you said was like, say you had a hundred visits or like you're setting those barometers when you're thinking about what the time range is for determining, does this have traffic or not? How do you think about that? Are you like looking at six months of data is it last month? Is it a year? How should people think about that? I, what I'll do is usually two things. I'll look at the last quarter. You definitely don't want to do only a month because I think that's too short of a time frame. Um, and then I compare it to the year previously. So, um, you know, you might see in a three month time span that the data has dropped month to month. Um, but if you look at the year previous, it actually overall is increased. So I think it, it comparing totals, whether it's totals or trends over time to the year previously, um, it's going to give you a better picture. And then also paying attention to the time of year. I mean, obviously, I'm sure most everyone listening, as, as I'm sure you've seen Ross's traffic drops a lot over the holidays. So that would be like the worst three month time period to even look at <laughs> because it's not conducive or conducive, whatever the word is, of like how that content is probably performing at a normal time of year. So I would say around the holidays, you probably want to do a previous three month period or you want to wait. Um, and then if there's other times within the industry that are or that are specific to your company um, where traffic is going crazy for whatever reason, then or really bad for whatever reason, then you might want to take that into consideration as well. Good information for sure. So I think you kind of touched on it and the tools you use are like, what is your kind of go-to tool set generally for, for deep diving on this stuff? Usually Ahrefs um, is the one that I like. Uh, SEMrush 
of course, is pretty good as well. But I feel like Ahrefs is a little more intuitive. Uh, Semrush to me, and I love Semrush. For any, anybody at Semrush listening, I still love you guys. <laughs> but they have so many features, it's almost like overwhelming. Um, and so Ahrefs, I, agree with I that. really yeah. like. And um, Ahrefs also used to have a template. Um I don't, I think when I tried to find it again, they had updated their blog post that had it, but it allowed you to do a content cannibalization analysis. So you could pull data from them and then put it into this templatized uh, spreadsheet that they created. And it it would show you key uh, posts that rank for the same keyword. And so I really liked that, but I'm kind of going on a tangent because I just thought of that when you mentioned, when I mentioned Ahrefs, but um, you could probably do that with any tool, like just pull what you're ranking for for a keyword and then do uh, a sort by keyword alphabetically, and it would put them theoretically um, all yeah. together. <laughs> but Ahrefs has really been uh, what I've mainly used. And Screaming Frog, of course, for the initial URL poll and then any other data that we might change as part of the process, like uh, meta titles or descriptions. You made me think of, I mean, it was an interesting use case of like articles that potentially are cannibalizing each other and thinking through that. Are there any like unique reasons that you wouldn't just see as data in a spreadsheet that you might end up telling someone they should cut a, a post or based on the cannibalization? Yeah, may, yeah maybe uh, that, that would, maybe that's the, the one example. Um, yeah, potentially cannibalization is like if you exported an audit for someone and you saw some unique characteristics about content that you ended up maybe on the surface, it has a little bit of traffic, but you might have a recommendation to combine articles or things like that. Um, yeah. You know, just wondering if any of those scenarios have ever come up. Yes, that's, I get what you're saying now. So the way we evaluate that is a lot of times looking at the post itself, which is why this can kind of be a time consuming process. Cause you, really do have to look at the most of the posts uh, individually. So there's been times can, content cannibalization, that's pretty easy to make a decision on because if both posts could easily be combined into one, then that's an easy decision to make. But there's other times or nuances where you kind of have to really have that industry knowledge to be able to make the decision. So one good example was um, this marketing blog I was working on. They had a ton of posts about Google Plus, and that didn't exist anymore. Rest in peace, Google Plus. So, <laughs> what we some did. Youngins out there don't, don't I know. know what that is. Yes, I know, I right? <laughs> um, so, what we did is we actually created a new post called, like, I don't know, like 15 alternatives to Google Plus. And then all of the existing marketing posts about Google Plus, we redirected to that post because Google Plus no longer existed. So that's an interesting scenario for that could apply to any industry. If there is like a technology that no longer exists, um, a product or service that you don't use or don't want to talk about anymore, um, maybe a person, maybe there's a bunch of interviews with a certain person that you don't want to have in there anymore. Those would all be good instances where it's a pretty easy decision to decide to delete those posts and, and redirect them to something else. But I will say with redirections is you want to make sure it makes sense. Because I know as a user, you know, I've clicked on maybe a, an old link in an article or something and it it's the site has redirected me to like a random article that isn't really related. And that's very off-putting. So I would make sure that, you know, when you are doing redirects, like it makes sense. Or even if you're not, you always want to redirect it to like a better post about that topic. But if there was ever a situation where you absolutely couldn't do that, I've seen it where they go to like a central article library and maybe there's a blurb that's like, hey, you clicked on an article that isn't here anymore. Check out this content. So you want to tell the user what's going on. Um, you know, as marketers, I could see, oh, it was a redirect that that article probably doesn't. I know that but the average user may not know that. So you you want to make sure that when you are redirecting, it goes to content that the original article that user is looking for, or you're letting them know what's going on. Yeah, that, those are great examples. You made me think of another follow-up question that you you sort of touched on a little bit, but I wonder if there's any more depth there. Like, obviously, there's two scenarios. 
potentially more, but I would guess most of your recommendations are 301 or 404 for articles. Like, are you 404 in a lot of stuff? Like, are you, are you tr getting pretty liberal with trying to redirect things? It sounds like you want to match the user intent. So I don't want to speak for you, but yeah. How do you think about that decision tree? I almost never do 404s if I can help it. Hmm. Like I would rather it, I would rather it be redirected to like a generic landing page. Like I said, that's like, Hey, this article is no longer existing. Check out our last webinar. And it may not exactly match user intent, intent than just like deleting a post and nothing's there. Um, the only time I would do that is if a post has never gotten any traffic or it's never ranked for anything, or maybe you could look in the link profile and there's no links to it. That would be an instance where it's probably safe to just delete it and it 404 because it, it can't really be found anymore, anywhere. Um, but if if there's any links on other sites to your to that article, then you do want to have a redirect, even if it's maybe not going to ma best match the user intent. So you're just kind of finding the best example there very often, and and moving that, or how often are you just three hundred one into the homepage? Again, it depends, I'm sure, but. How do you think about that? <laughs> it does depend because I I usually, what we've done is it's always going to, if you're doing blog posts, it's always going to 301 to like a better blog post. I mean, that's our goal, right? So with a lot of these, what we'll do is if we decide to create a pillar post about a set topic, what we'll do is we'll decide the URL of that pillar post. And a lot of times it'll be the one that has either the most complete information or maybe the easiest URL. So if we went if we went back to the Google Plus example, like if we had a blog post that was just yourwebsite.com slash Google Plus, we keep that. And then all the other articles about Google Plus are redirected. And we take, if we were going to keep that information in the other articles, we would, we'd have our writers look at all the articles we're going to redirect pull any information that's still useful and helpful um, and isn't included in the the new like pillar article. I'm doing air quotes about uh, for that topic. <laughs> um, and and then that's when we would delete the post after that was all done. So that's another thing that you know we haven't even talked about is like when we when we do do redirects, we do try to look at the posts we're going to redirect and see if there's anything worth saving in there um, and either turn it into a new post or combine it to the post, add it to the post that we're redirecting to if it if it's missing that information. Now, there's some clients who just happen to have posts that cover the same thing over and over just due to lack of maybe turnover or they were just kind of letting a freelance writer write whatever they want. So as a result, you know, they have three posts about the same topic that are really similar and don't aren't aren't unique enough to like be combined into one post. In those cases, we would also probably just 301 redirect to the best post. Um, and then the post that we decide is getting all the redirects, the pillar post, that would be updated. So that'd be part of the process is like, okay, a lot of posts are going to be redirected to this one, um, especially if those posts we're redirecting have a lot of traffic, then, you know, the chances are those redirects are going to bring more traffic to this pillar post. So we need to make sure that that it's updated and has correct information. Even if we're not pulling um, information from the post we're redirecting, we still want to make sure that that it's up to date and there's not anything missing. Have you ever, you made me think of one scenario done, like if you're adding content from an old post that you're now deleting, and you move it to a new section, but maybe it's only part of the post now. Have you ever done like a jump to redirect or mm -hmm. like where it's one section of the site and a table of contents and you like jump to the tool section because you had a post on tools and it's like a bigger hub page or does that overcomplicate mm -hmm. it? No, I haven't. Does that make sense? That. Are I, you following? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you could. Um, one thing that I have done before is I worked for a client where 
at the end of every table of contents or at the end of every article, depending on the length, they wanted um, additional articles and then like a bulleted list of, of extra of related articles the the user could go to that was just like in their style guide. So that could be an instance where, you know, we might add a link like that. Um, if somebody wanted to feature additional content that the user could click through to, but I haven't done that with jump links. Yeah, something to think about. It. Yeah, probably not yeah. super. Yeah, common use case, but uh, you made me think about it. There's some some advanced uh, could be processes helpful. you're yeah. using. Yeah. So uh, you touched on this a little bit, uh, but to get more granular. Uh, in, interested to know how you scope these like how do you think about how long this should take how long should it take for again it depends we should just call this it depends but yeah <laughs> um i think it de it depends on how many <laughs> urls so when i'm scoping i'll i'll look at you know screaming frog or their site map and just get it or if i have wordpress access or whatever and look at how many content posts are in there and how many pages are in there. And that gives me a good idea as to cost and then also timeline that it takes. Um, and usually when I've done audits, whether it's content or SEO, I make it a phased process. So if it was a really huge site, then I might say, okay, for this quarter, we're, on, we're gonna do spend the first month on auditing the top 1000 blog posts the next two months in the quarter, we're going to make our changes that we, you know, like you and I have talked about, about like redirects and updates. And that might also be just assigning things out. That's another big part of the process, depending on your team is, um, you know, some of the audits I've been on, I, I didn't do all the updates. I assigned them all out. And so, you know, maybe for quarter one, we're just doing a thousand posts and that's our first phase. And then we'll keep going. Um, but then there's been other times where there's maybe only like a hundred piece, you know, blog posts and content pages. So that's pretty easy to do the whole audit on, you know, in a couple weeks or whatever we need and then make the changes within the next, you know, couple weeks or months. I, I like to work a quarter at a time because I feel like with big scale projects like this, it's usually a good amount of time to not only finish your audit, but then also start implementing on it. I think that answered your question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, when I, when I think of the idea of an audit very often, I'm it's like, Oh, this is a one time thing that you're, you're doing. And obviously you can repeat it, but are you saying in there's, there's scenarios where effectively your process of auditing doesn't end. It's kind of like monthly effectively for a big enough site is that am i hearing that correctly yeah it definitely is ongoing like i worked on a site where they had six thousand blog posts so it was definitely a phased approach like we just kept going <laughs> i didn't by the time but by the time the contract was was ended we hadn't even audited every blog post like we just had to break it up by priority and do the best we could um so it it depends on of course your size of your site if it's a huge site like that with six thousand pages it is going to be ongoing and you're just going to do it by phases highest priority what you handle for that month or quarter whatever your time frame is and then phase two phase like whatever the phase is and then by the end you probably depending on the length of time you might need to start at the beginning and and look at your top priority pieces again um you know, a lot of people always ask me, how often should I do a content audit? And I would say, like, if you only have a small amount of, of posts, like 100 or 200 posts, then probably doing it every six months to once a year is fine. Um, but if you have a huge site, like the one I mentioned, it really is like a rolling part of the process. And when I um, had my contract there, it really was just built in as part of our ongoing process. I mean, we had part of the team that was just working on new content and the other part was just rewrites and revisions and redirects. And that was just like part of our ongoing process. And I think, you know, I mentioned this in, in the beginning, that's something that I think a lot of organizations haven't grasped yet is like audits 
aren't a one-time thing and you're done. It's not like taxes. It's like <laughs> a, if you have a lot of content that you care about, which you should. I mean, if why produce content if it's not stuff you're going to care about and and know is high quality? It really should be part of your ongoing process. And that's something I think I um, mentioned this. Search Engine Journal did like a 2022 SEO prediction, and I was an expert in there and. And one of my predictions, which I don't know if it'll happen this year um, or, you know, we'll see it in the next couple of years, is like that'll be more of a role or a service that people will offer is, you know, you'll see these big companies that might be hiring for one person or a team of people that all they do is the updating. Um, and it's more of just that ongoing process like we talked about. Um, and that's something, you know, that I really like doing is the audit process. And that's why at six stories, you know, we've chosen to kind of specialize in that because I really want to make sure people know that this is a a reoccurring thing. And for bigger sites, it should just be an ongoing thing. Yeah, that makes sense. I I wonder just the framing of calling it something about audit feels like it's punctuated by a period at the end. Like maybe it's auditing or content auditing or something that I, I don't know, that feels more progressive might might help but i agree uh and that makes a lot of sense and kind of tying everything together for sure so would you generally say let's say assuming you have bandwidth for an entire website or like you can you have somehow you have the staff to look at every url at some frequency of time is there a a guideline of what that would be if you knew you could get to every url with the resources you have x amount of times how often would you like look at each if if that makes sense if resources would, weren't a constraint yeah yeah i would say every six to 12 months that's we the are, dream now i don't i don't know if i <laughs> i don't know if reality yeah. that's possible but like you said if resources weren't an issue um that would be I, the goal I think it depends on industry too, though. It depends because, you know, some industries don't change that much. Like manufacturing, I don't know. I don't mean to, I'm not hating on manufacturing, but like in my brain, and might be, I'm totally wrong. That doesn't change a lot. Like how to make a plastic mold, if that's what you specialize in, then a lot of times your content probably won't change unless there's some huge like breakthrough in plastic Technology mold making. Change, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But for things that change really fast, like our industry, if if you have a marketing blog, then you need to be looking at that six to 12 months because things get discontinued. Advice is no longer um, good anymore. Um, it just depends on how fast your industry changes. And sometimes I've seen like if an industry changes really fast, then you have a unique opportunity to not only update your existing content, but then create that new content and figure out how those work together. Because if you're in an industry where there's a lot of developments all the time, like I could see this for like blockchain or crypto or NFTs, which I know is controversial right now, but it's changing so fast that there's a lot of opportunity there to create new content about new technology. But then at the same time, you need to be updating your old content. If it's found that, you know, things that worked for Bitcoin or the blockchain three years ago are like laughable now. I don't know. Um, So really looking at your industry and how fast things change can help you decide how often you're going to do an audit and, and how to prioritize it. Yeah. I like that. One thing we made up some, some stupid term, but I call it a freshness distance is like, you look at the search result and see how often the dates or like what the distance between the newest and the oldest result is can be kind of a nice indicator but it tends to be pretty common across it. Like to your point, if it was gardening, that doesn't change that much, uh, I would think. So you yeah. can update like every couple of years if you wanted to um, and things like that. Also thinking of the idea of audits. If I worked at a company where we also did what we would call an audit, but we only looked at the statistics. So maybe we're not updating um, every article, but we would do a site search for the year 2019 or whatever our cutoff is. Usually you don't want stats that are older than three to five years in most 
it depends in most cases, uh, especially ones that are changing fast, like marketing. Anything past like 2019 or 2018 now, I as a marketer, I'm kind of like, eh, I don't know if that would really be effective, especially with COVID. I think it's changed a lot of industries. But um, that's another layer is like also thinking about audits in different levels. So I know as we've been recording this, we're kind of thinking of it holistically, but there's also little arms of audits you can do like the statistics part, or if you have a new feature, um, I know we talked about that WordPress plugin I mentioned. So when they released that, this huge new feature they had, we went back and audited articles that mentioned um, a related feature and added in the new feature. So to me, those are also audits, but they're for, for a very specific reason. Um, whether to add something, add internal linking or update a statistic. Are those kind of the main points for the non, I'm going to cut something thought process or are those the, the big ones that you would do that for? Yeah. I, I mean, off the top of my head, I'm sure there's other instances, but yeah, for sure. Makes sense. So one thing I've gotten stuck on a little bit, um, obviously is this, is the amount of content we've done grows and we have, so we have an SEO team internally smaller than our content marketing team, but content marketing team are SEOs like yourself. And then there's SEOs who are a little more technical, but still get content. So anyways, I get a little stuck thinking like if you're operationalizing and you've worked on big websites, how you would break out this task. Like in some ways you could have that content marketer who originally created the first piece of content just naturally have on their kind of, roadmap to update the post they wrote last year the next right. year that would seem to make sense but right. then someone like you could just maybe naturally go in and update this content but would you say you could do that but could you would you say to someone like you that would come in don't touch this content it's already being monitored by someone i i think you get where i'm going with this how would you think about that for like a bigger website what feels like a an efficient like way to structure this activity that's a really good point so i've seen things start to break down when you break up each page by role so um i did work for a huge foundation i can't say who they were who they are but you would know who they are like maybe think one of the hugest foundations in the world we had a content writer we had an SEO person and then we had a content strategist like as part of the holistic team. And that was kind of a mess because we had it, we had things set up in our CMS and you knew your responsibilities, all of that was good. But because you were only focused on one little portion of it, sometimes those more holistic things were missed. So if I did the content strategy side, I found myself working more closely with the SEO person than originally they thought I would because we needed to get on the same page about user intent. Now, I know SEO, so that was maybe a little bit easier for me, but the SEO, it was hard for me to like not do keyword analysis and stuff and let him handle it. Um, but he would often find things because he had the time and space to do that, that I wouldn't have. But it did lead to a lot of like back and forth. Oh, I have to wait for him to get back to me before I can answer this. So when I have led the process and not just been a part of it um, on a large scale team or if it's a smaller site that, you know, my team is handling, um, I found more success in giving someone total ownership a piece at a time. So and that might mean training a writer on SEO. Um, and that's probably something I could like do a whole other podcast on is like <laughs> there seems to be a disconnect or a learning gap between content writers and SEO and I've that's something that's been hard to hire for is writer online writers who actually know and understand SEO at a, at not not that they could do it full time but they understand it enough um, sometimes that's difficult but I have found that having a really good writer and taking the time to train them on SEO overall the updating process the rewrite process whatever you're deciding to do with the piece goes a lot smoother and they feel a lot more accountability for each separate piece or like piece as a whole instead of like 
their one little corner of it. And because I find when you have one little corner of like a content rewrite or an update, things get missed. But when you assign it to one person, they, it, it just like holistically works better because they their mind, I don't know if it's like a mindset thing, but they just feel more accountable as a whole for the piece itself. So it works better. Um, so that's kind of my rambling answer. It's like <laughs> as a piece by piece basis, it should be assigned by person instead of you do SEO for all of our rewrites and you do all the content updates for the rewrites. Like I just, sometimes there's a big disconnect. Sometimes there's not, but in my opinion, there, there has been. So in your situation, would you, there's someone like you more senior kind of delegating this to a writer to then own and execute it end to end. Does that kind of sound right? Like that's your ideal. Right. If I'm yeah. hearing correctly. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. So that, that, that's how I was, I was thinking of, we're, we're like, we, a lot of what we do is train at, great writers on SEO is our process and it's not always easy for sure. Um, right. <laughs> but that, that, that can hopefully make it, make it so that, that writer has a capability, but it makes complete sense. If you had to chop it up, that's not going to be super effective for people. And I mean, that's, we're kind of getting this direction of what are things that can go wrong with these audits? What have you seen people do incorrectly from or talk about processes incorrectly? Like what, what should people avoid there? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, the first thing that comes to mind and it relates to what we were just talking about, uh, you know, assigning it to writers is if you leave things too open-ended, then there's a lot more work on the back end after receiving, you know, a rewrite or a revision. So you want to make sure to have guidelines in place, like anywhere I've gone where I've handled this type of thing um, long term, you know, it's not just a regular content audit, but maybe I've like when I when I was executive editor of Search Engine Journal, I created a style guide and an editorial process and guidelines. So everybody knew what all what needed to be included in each article they knew the format we needed like with headers they knew images we needed internal linking policies external whatever um, so you want to have that and i've i've seen some places that have tried to do audits where it's just like hey look at this these list of posts and tell me if it's good or bad but you want to make sure the people evaluating and the writers know what's considered good and know what's considered bad. So uh, another thing that's worked really well that it took me a while to learn worked so well is to give writers or whoever's working on it an example of a really good piece of content. So maybe something that's recently been written that's just amazing or something that somebody updated or rewrote that, look, you know, um, Sam edited this specific header to include XYZ information. Here's why he did it. I found that teams are a lot more successful when you give them exact examples of what's good and bad. So I think uh, when you're doing content audits, you want to make sure you have examples that people can look to compare against of what, you know, what's going to be considered success and what is considered something that needs to be improved and why. At least for me, when I used to be a writer, I wanted to know why um, walking people through that is really helpful. Um, the other thing, too, which I think we mentioned before we started recording, is usually making the decision itself of what to redirect, what to rewrite, what to revise. That takes a little bit of expertise. Um, I'd like to think that maybe someone junior or a few years under their belt could do is pull all the data that we talked about in the beginning. I would I would love to have some walk somebody through that and train them how to do that. But the the eye it takes to actually make the determining decisions, sometimes that does take a senior person or someone who just has a little more expertise. Um, Cause we can look at the metrics that you and I talked about, but um, sometimes, and this is so like cheesy and I hate to say it, but sometimes like a gut feeling does help, um, especially if you know the industry really well. Like that Google Plus thing, um, nobody brought that up. Like I, because I knew Google Plus 
was no longer existed, that was my gut feeling to like go find Google Plus. Um, maybe that's not the best example for making decisions, but um, you just somebody senior that has a little more experience is probably better qualified to make the decisions faster. Um, and that's not to say, yeah, someone more junior couldn't take a first crack at it or you couldn't train and walk somebody through it. Um, but just having someone that's more experienced in content and hopefully SEO as well, um, it really does does help with determining and the speed of de- determining as well. Like I'm sure I could look through a spreadsheet and make the decisions a lot faster than someone that's just learning the process, which is understandable. So on that process and seniority or not, another kind of like micro in the weeds detail of the stuff that I've thought about is just like literally who's making the change. And also should you have a quality assurance layer of that change? So like if you're doing a content, like an update, the post is already live. Maybe it's not a full rewrite. It's just like there's minor tweaks to it. In that scenario for a bigger website, more scale, like maybe it is someone junior on the front lines. Do you just, what would your process be to not make that really uh, convoluted and have a ton of checkpoints? I I get a little stuck there of like, should we be sending that every single one to a client? Should we have a manager review every single one? How do you think about that? Usually what we've done, yeah, yeah, is is the the checks are done at the end of our process and we never have the clients do it because we want to find any issues before a client does. Um, or if you if you're in house look at, listening to this, like ideally you or your team would want to fix an issue before someone else finds it. Um, and and the person who does that has varied. Um, there's been times when I've done it just because there's nobody else. So I've assigned out all the articles and then they're updated. Um, I don't want to be a bottleneck though. So um, in the past, I would give them the freedom to make the update and publish it. But then once it's published, then um, I would check it. There's also been times I had this amazing uh, virtual assistant who he would check basic stuff. Like he would go, it'd get assigned, it auto assigned in Trello through automations. Automations in Trello, by the way, are, are amazing. Like when things get moved to boards, it automatically was assigned to him. And he had a checklist. Um, so you kind of mentioned that, like a checklist of things to check for that he looked at every time. Broken links. Was it, were the notes followed in the brief if it was like a revision? Like, was the paragraph we needed to add, was that added? Um, and if there were issues, then he would flag it to me. So I've seen it done several different ways. And I think it just depends on the talent available. But you want to try to not be a bottleneck and you want to try to trust your team. So there's a balance between like, let's get things out and publish and nobody's waiting on final approval, but also if there's issues that come up, then you have to be flexible enough to say, okay, we need to pause this and figure out what the issue is because we can't publish things that have major mistakes. So I always lean towards trusting, like trust, but verify is a saying I've heard before. So like trusting the writers or, or whoever's on my team, empowering them, you know, and that's kind of what I, I try to do with, you know, assigning one person, one piece is like, you're the ownership of this. It's so exciting. I'm so excited for you. Like make it real positive. And truly like, I want them to succeed. Um, and just making them feel like they're set up for success. So having complete checklists, you know, before you hit publish, every update or every rewrite needs to have X, Y, Z. And we've had literal like printable or Google Doc checklists. And it seems so basic, but checklists really help. Um, There's a book called The Checklist Manifesto that literally is all about checklists, but it talks about like studies that have been shown that simple checklists really have helped like um, problems in hospitals go down or things like that. And, And I do that all the time for other projects I have is I have checklists for things that are really intense because you just never know. And and when you get too comfortable with something, that's when things start to fall through the cracks. Um, so I always try to set people up for success, 
but also make sure they have all the tools as well. And then if there's ever an issue, I can say, we have the checklist, there's a process, is there, what about this isn't working, that there's a disconnect. Um, and then just try to keep streamlining and ironing out the process as you go. Because I think as you continue to do this, whether it's one time for a client or it's going to be built into your total in-house uh, process, um, you need to keep refining. And, and if you notice things aren't working in the process that worked when you first started it, to cut those out and don't be afraid to make changes if you think something can be more efficient. Yeah, I love that checklist idea uh, for sure. Like, especially with a lot of these blogs and WordPress things, there's like so many small things you gotta like check right. off. Like even the most organized person will miss things. <laughs> there's like, yeah, a lot of details in, in content. So I love that. And I'm probably gonna, we have a lot of process docs, but I might go make a few checklists myself after this. And for some uh, reason, <laughs> the format of checklists aren't as intimidating. Like you can say, we have the style guide. Why didn't you follow it? Well, my eyes glaze over when I look at like a five page it's just content marketing effectively. Paragraph. Yeah. Yeah. Scannable. So a little, Crazy yeah, note. biteable, <laughs> yeah, graphics yeah. Uh, checklist, I think really help. Is we're getting to the end here. What is the, what's the power of these things? Obviously, if you're iterating on audits, there might be not a beginning and after <laughs> impact, but a, I'm sure people would love to hear like what kind of impact you've seen from some, some of this auditing work. Um, I would say the biggest thing, and I'm not taking credit for this whole process at all, but before I left Search Engine Journal, we did an audit and we were working through updating everything. And then I ended up leaving Search Engine Journal um, and Danny Goodwin, who's great, took over. Um, and I think like a year to two years after I left, they had ended up doubling their traffic. And this is something he's talked about publicly, so I'm not you know, giving away any secrets, but <laughs> they ended up doubling their, their website traffic. Um, and I know that's probably a lot of factors, right? Like great continued, great content and great webinars and whatever else. But I know a lot of that was from the work we did with editing the content and doing the audit and revisiting. So there is a, is potential to really make a huge impact um, on projects that I've, you know, seen through, um, I've seen an increase, you know, in conversion rate, like doubling or even up like 25 to 50 percent. And a lot of times and I don't want to say this was is guaranteed, but a lot of times it happens fast, um, especially if your post is already ranking pretty well. I've seen those changes in conversion rate or, you know, clicks or traffic or whatever metrics you're using. I've seen that happen fairly fast, which is always really rewarding to see um doesn't have doesn't always happen fast but like even like in the first couple months when we've started implementing these and making the changes to see the results you know has always been really great yeah i would agree when we do content audits have seen similar speed which in the seo world is kind of nice to have uh something actually happen relatively quickly yeah, once your site exactly. gets crawled <laughs> So this has been great, Kelsey. I asked you a lot of nerdy questions, so I'm sorry. But um, no, you're good. I love it. It was, <laughs> it was a good conversation. So, uh, how can people find you? Uh, yeah, t tell tell them where they can find you on the on the web and anything else they need to know. Yes. So I am an Oasis fan. So I am on Twitter at Wonderwall Seven um, and Instagram on Wonderwall Seven. Um, and then LinkedIn, of course. And then I also have a podcast. Um, it's called Story Shout. And we're on a hiatus for the summer, but it's about failure. So we talk about um, like one thing the guest sucks at per episode. So uh, it's Story Shout on all social medias and like Stitcher, Spotify, Apple podcasts everywhere. Um, and we have a lot of marketing people on there too. So um, like Dr. Pete. Um, Lauren Baker from SEJ is going to be on next season. Um, just a ton of people. So that's also a good nice. place to, to learn more about me. Yeah. I love that unique angle. I'll definitely be listening to, to some of those. Uh, it's great that you take that different take. Um, we're just interviewing people here on SEO, but I love that you found, <laughs> found a unique uh, podcast angle, which, which is more rare than it seems these days. So thank you for coming on, Kelsey. This is great. Uh, and yeah, go check her out on all those channels. 
and let's get some auditing done. Thanks for coming on. Thank you.